the benefit of work cooperatives, you know, uh, basically we've talked about um, the surplus, you know, which I like that word better yes. uh, than it profits. Or they dividends. go to the workers that obviously, you know, uh, produce it. Hello. Right. You know, so, and then the, of course, the, as we've said over and over, and we will repeat it over and over, the workers make the decisions democratically. Hello. <laughs> So the, uh, we've gone over, we've gone over the business advantages of worker cooperatives. I think, um, or, or I should say, uh, let, let's talk about more of the benefits mm -hmm. to the community and the environment. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, the tax estate and the uh, local tax pool for local community yes. needs, right. not for, mm -hmm. as I mentioned earlier, in the pockets of rich people who want to pass on the burden, you know, um, that they don't want to pay for. Um, there's also, um, you, that way you become a better steward of your local environment, mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, and you're more engaged in, in, in civil and local activities. Mm -hmm. Your health care is less of an issue because you don't, and, and you're going to your job, you, you know, mm -hmm. you don't have to travel like we do here in L.A. Mm -hmm. I, know, I know so many people that are on, I mean, all you have to do at any time of day, particularly rush hour, and mm -hmm. you see that, you know, people still like going the 210 freeway, the 101, the 405 line. Why don't you live close to where you work? <laughs> What's going on here? This doesn't, it just, it doesn't make any sense. And now it's time, are you ready? It's time <laughs> to really buckle down here. Uh, and because this is a Now Man show, of course this is a pertinent question. Why worker cooperatives now? <laughs> we need to own the economy. Yes. That's my first answer. That's, what yeah. do you guys think? We need to own the economy. Well, uh, I would, uh like to say that we're in a massive institutional crisis, political yes. and economic, and it's enduring, and it's getting worse, and the historical record seems to be proving that. So one of the major issues is, uh, what are the policies that are going to get us out of this? Uh, apparently the old policies, which were based on the capitalist model, was uh, minor reform, some regulation, but you don't change the underlying uh, relationships of economic or political power, meaning what we're talking about here is empowering workers in the workplace democratically. If that doesn't change, then the sense of the system will move on, kind of you know creaking along, but the uh, the workers themselves will still be in the same position. They'll be essentially disempowered. Mm -hmm, that's right. The point is, if you empower them, then you'll have a ramification, uh, ramifying effect, where you start. Uh, changing the workplace, therefore it starts changing the outside community, therefore it starts changing the larger uh, uh, political institutions, right, state, exactly. local, state, and federal. And we also need to um, educate people about, uh, you know, the, um, not only the history that's involved in policy making um, and um, in this country and even in, from a global standpoint, but also to, you know, what's going on in current events. A lot of people have, a, as you you refer to a lot, a lot of political confusion about what's actually going on in current events. Yeah. You know what I mean? And or understanding political strategies and how people use the system for their own personal gain in in political elections or or political uh, interactions of uh, business behavior. Right. You know, like like in lobbying, for instance. And yeah. and and we need to, I mean, we need to get the money out of politics. Yeah. I mean, it, to me, this is not just. You know, I'm going to say we need to get money out of politics. We need to actually get yeah. that money out of the political system, to folks, the, because it's a problem. The clearest message from the last election is that people are unhappy with yeah. uh, the way politicians operate. Yeah. yeah. And the um, the biggest uh, part of that is the fact that they owe their uh, allegiance not to the voter, but to the people who paid for their campaign. Mm, that's right. The yeah. big donors um, that paid for their campaign. So consequently, if we want our democracy back, we need to get money out of politics. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so the, you know, I worked a lot on this topic. I work for organized labor, so obviously I do. But yeah. the um, uh, there's a point where you know uh, the, you watch people come up with various fixes to the economic system, bills to regulate, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, don donations and whatnot. But there is a fundamental principle, uh, and what I watched was that uh, it, people are, are putting the band-aid here and the band-aid there to try to to you know 
put the finger in the dike or whatever, the little fix up. Mm -hmm. But the fundamental principle is that we do not own our own economy. Uh, the fact that, uh, you know, that so much uh, wealth inequality exists uh, and is, is fundamental to this mm -hmm. uh, and it's one of the greatest problems in our society now. So in order to reverse that, we have to take back ownership of our mm -hmm. economy. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, and the only way we can do that is to create worker cooperatives. Yeah. That's I the agree. only principle. So that's why I have now made that decision that this is what I'm working on. Uh, this is the fundamental and there's, you know, there's a lot of people doing good work and those band-aids and those fixes you know, have to be done because we have to exist in the world as it is now. But if somebody has to be working on, some mm -hmm. people have That's to work right. on what is the mm -hmm. fundamental underlying uh, problem. And it's a long-term uh, fight. That's right. Uh, so that's why you know you can't just only do this, you have to do all those other things as well. That's right. Uh, yeah. But um, in, we have to start now. Because right. we're, we're on a speeding train, heading for a cliff, accelerating as we go, yep. waiting for the bridge to be built before we get there. That's right. Mm -hmm. so That's to, right. to touch on all that, you know, we uh, uh, there's that Stanford study, I believe it was, that... that Princeton study. Princeton, Princeton study. Think, yeah, 2014. That, that showed us <laughs> That's that... That's uh, part of what I was going to talk about in this. Yeah. That, that yeah. showed us that, um, you know, and people in, you know, across the political spectrum talk about how it's oh, we have to change policy, as you guys have touched on. Um, the problem is, is that we have actual studies that show that it doesn't matter who you put in office, it doesn't matter what, uh, what principles yeah. get pushed, what, what talking points the politician comes with and what people buy into. What you get at the end of the day is policy that's geared towards people who are donating money right. to the politicians that's themselves. Right. The people who have their voice heard the most are the people that have the most money. And that's what that Princeton study showed us, mm -hmm. and it's across the board always been the case. And, 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 so, and to give a little background, which I've done, I've talked a little bit on the show a lot, because you know, I, I, there's certain things that just have to be repeated, and yeah. I want to do that in this moment in time. Yeah. Um, there were over 1,700 policies from that were implemented into law between mm -hmm. 1981 and 2002. So I'm assuming that includes that Patriot Act that everybody <laughs> talks about. <laughs> okay, that's my reaction. Okay, um, and it's, they came to the conclusion that, and, and it, it was an open question. Yeah. Basically, is the United States, you know, um, a democracy, or an oligarchy, or is it um, a combination of of democracy and oligarchy, or is it just 100% oligarchy. And based on the analysis of over 7, 1,700 policies, bills, etc., 100% oligarchy. Yeah. And what that means, basically, people, is that um, the most important decisions, guess, guess how much you and I have input into that? Zero. Zero. Absolutely not. Okay. Right. Right. Very well-meaning people become politicians, and I've known yeah. a number of them, yeah. and they're, they're strong, they're, they're con committed, they're, uh, you know, very good people, but once you get in office, all you can, all you have to plan for is how are you going to get re-elected. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And so the re-election process depends on the, the funding from large donors. Yeah. Uh, now, the other thing I'll say about that is corporations are no longer governed by our national government, right. national bodies. They're no longer responsive right. or accountable to nations. They are larger than nations. Yeah. That's yes, right. That's, that's right. You're, and, you're right. And so with all that said, you know, you have a system where we can see with data that the policy doesn't respond to the public's will. It responds specifically to corporate will. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, we know that the incentive system of profit the incentive system of capitalism is the problem and is the thing that we need to, that is most important to focus on. And so people who focus on, uh, there, there are a lot of people who focus on policy and personally, I feel that that's such a misguided approach. This is why worker cooperatives are so important right now. Worker cooperatives are our best opportunity mm. to take economic control over the means of production to take economic control that's over right. the things that are going to allow us to have that political power. And that's absolutely correct. And I think, I also think, you know, um, people need to be armed with information about how they're affected and why that is important. Yeah. In other words, you know, every year, I, I, I look forward actually, or not look forward, uh, to looking at the updated Oxfam statistics, you know, that come out. They, they usually uh, mm -hmm. announce them at the, uh, uh, 
the, the Davos uh, Economic Summit in Switzerland every year in January, and uh, every year they just get worse and worse. And this year there are eight people on the planet uh, that may have changed to five yeah. who have as much wealth as the, the bottom 50% of the world's population. Mm -hmm. Now, when I first heard that, I don't know how many years back now, that you know, there were, I think it was 62 the first time I saw statistics on that. Now it's down to eight, possibly five. Um, I was like, I was shocked. I mean, that's, in other words, uh, uh, sh that's shocking, maybe is more the right word. Just, yeah. that was my reaction. Mm -hmm. I wasn't surprised, but I found it shocking mm -hmm. that actually somebody you know, had that statistical analysis, and it's blatant and it's obvious. So that should get you to think about that. Plus the employment statistics, everybody knows is a joke. 94% uh, of the, the jobs that were created between 2008 and 2016 were um, part-time temporary, what they call gig jobs, which we musicians know what that means. And, and uh, also, if there were full-time positions, most, most of them were low wage. So, I mean, it's, and, and the 4% the that they say is the low unemployment rate, that's pertaining to the last three months that they have the official data, which they always put out every mm -hmm. three months. That's why they call them quarterly reports. I mean, you know, it's just, there's so much, you know, that's just not correct. There's underemployment. There's people that they're not even report anymore because they just gave up looking for work because it's what's the point? Because it is, this is another episode. We can talk well, about stuff, but right. we're now, economy, we had talked about corporations externalizing costs so the taxpayers pay. So that's, that affects your income too mm -hmm. if you are working. So because as a taxpayer, you pay on everything. So you're paying a personal income tax. Every time you go to the store, you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're paying a, a consumer tax. Right, they're all regressive taxes. You know, they're all, you and, know. Yes. And you have, so, uh, so th th that, that means that also too, you know, not only is it less out of your pocket, but it's less going into the community. Uh, and I um, know a person that, that analyzed uh, the, uh, the, the tax records that were available at the time, and he's the guy that wrote the blogs uh, in 2010, 2011, that got the attention of Adbusters Magazine and Anonymous, uh, and they together created uh, a couple of movements you might have heard mm -hmm. of, uh, the 99% movement in Occupy Wall Street, and those were based on tax records that I know, he, I know him personally, and um, William Black, Robert Reich, people like that. Uh, there's also uh, now uh, hidden wealth. Uh, what's called capital flows or mobile capital is now global, mm -hmm. and this is what we were talking about a little earlier, uh, that the new you know, era of capitalism or neoliberalism, globalization of finance capital mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. where you have the flow of trillions of dollars kind of floating above everybody, globally mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and yet offshore tax havens because now capital and capitalists and corporations are mobile but workers are confined within the boundaries of sovereign states. Mm -hmm. This whole issue of the immigration issue which is used as a scapegoat issue that if you look at it from a global point of view when capital moves it tries to essentially imprison workers within low wage uh, what they call uh, uh, free export zones or whatever. Yes. That was all the NAFTA and free, whole idea of free trade concepts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can look back at it on a, as a global phenomenon. And this, all this stuff supports the, uh, the data we've gotten that capitalism by its very nature, its very structure, is a highly exploitative system. And yes, this is the outcome right. of it. The that's right. Of it. That's right. Exploitative exactly. economics. Yeah. It also has a boom and bust cycle. Yes. So you run in, make as much money as you can, and then capital well, flight. Well, that's the whole concept of destroying communities. That's the old idea of a boom town and a ghost town, mm -hmm. which everybody knows about, you know, watch Western movies. If you really look at that history, that's really what it comes out to. Is capitalism is a system that will go in and it's kind of like getting a cocaine fix. <laughs> you. Mm -hmm infuse so much capital and exploit so much labor to extract surplus value in the millions or billions of dollars, and then you take that and you walk away with it and leave everybody else. It's kind of like when the, the tide recedes and you walk away yeah. with all the, you know, the wealth. Yeah. So you literally destroy societies and communities. Absolutely. That's the idea they start falling apart. And so we have all the data, all the characteristics of major institutional crisis. You know, the Gillen's Page 
uh, analysis of oligarchy, uh, the famous uh, work by uh, pr uh, Professor Sheldon Wallen and Democracy Inc., which Chris Hedges did a fabulous interview about. Where he talks about on an RT, he has an RT television show, right? right on, yeah. contact, on contact too. Contact. And then, of course, the recent yeah. one, mm -hmm. uh, Professor Chomsky, did a, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. a fabulous, uh, you know, interview on the Requiem for the American Dream. Yeah, yeah that was what good. essentially yeah. he did yeah. was he just summed up the historical endpoint where we're at. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, everything essentially is falling apart. It's totally falling apart. So, um, I want to make sure we, we get a little time here to talk about Lucy, oh. Um, oh, yeah. and uh, and then and get into uh, uh, also uh, the hard work that goes into uh, worker cooperatives, which we talked about. Uh, what does Lucy do? Tell us a little bit about that organization. It stands for uh, Los Angeles Union Cooperative Initiative. Um, so we operate on a variety of levels. Our, uh, our fundamental and long-term um, purpose is to actually incubate, uh, convert, um, uh, do startups, you know, uh, incubate businesses that mm -hmm. are worker cooperatives. But you know, we also mediate the that zone between worker co the worker cooperative community and uh, and labor unions as they are today. And um, because the worker cooperative community, you're talking about entrepreneurs. They're usually not people who have been in unions, and so they don't see the natural relationship between mm -hmm. unions and worker cooperatives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then on the union side, I'm sorry, we're just we're really busy fighting back. You know, um, the attacks on unions, and um, you know, trying to operate at a scale which is. You know, vastly different than worker cooperatives, mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. the union community is not really, you know, seeing the worker cooperative community as an alternative for them because the scale is so much different. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to mediate that line to get people talking to each other. That's what we do in the Union Co-op Council of the U.S. Federation of mm -hmm. Worker Cooperatives on a national scale. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. Lucy is uh, that um, group that of union activists and um, that are attempting to do that in the Los Angeles area. Um, so we, you know, we speak uh, and we try to educate the community, but we also uh, look for opportunities uh, to uh, create worker cooperative businesses. Mm -hmm. And in Los Angeles, there's been estimated that about 10,000 small businesses will change hands due to the baby boomers retiring. Wow. This is, you know, nationwide, there's like, I think it's three to five trillion dollars worth of businesses. Wow, wow. Something, some enormous number. I don't quote me on that number because I'm just pulling that out of my memory banks. It's a lot. It's a lot of businesses that will change hands due to baby boomers retiring. Um, now, what do we want? Do we want them to close that business and 20 people each lose their job? Hmm. No, what we want to do is we want to see them continue through that crisis of leadership. Uh, and so we're proposing the alternative of turning them into worker cooperatives. The people that have worked there know how to do their work. They know how mm -hmm. to do the job. Um, and they've been working together for a while. So, um, of course, if they're unionized, they have a tremendous sense of solidarity, which yeah. is, is, is equivalent to cooperative education. Right. Uh, but if they're not, you know, that can be developed. Uh, and so, you know, we'd like to step into that that void there and help convert those businesses to local, locally owned worker cooperatives because then they're going to stay in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not going to be closed by their corporate owners and the, their their assets. Re you know, they're not going to create ghost towns. Ghost towns, no. exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. exactly. Right. Even in Southern out California, of Los even in, exactly. out of Los Angeles, exactly. Right. Exactly. right. And so um, it's in our interest as community members to right. make sure that happens. Uh, and so we're trying to take the lead on that. That uh, principle. And going forward, I definitely want to talk to you more and more about the work that you do and your partners. And uh, you know, we'll uh, actually get some case studies, maybe get some case studies in here uh -huh. or go in the field and do stories on them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that would be a, a great ongoing. And some personal way. collaboration. Right. Yeah, a personal <laughs> collaboration as well as an educational one for people tuning in and watching and listening. And because yeah. uh, we are going like to turn these into more blogs. One point too. to what you're saying uh, are the. Uh, the educational institutions involved. We're going to start through community colleges, universities, and right. colleges, yes, we creating are. this bridge and institutionalizing that education to bring unions and co-ops together. Well, yeah, we are building those bridges yeah. uh, now. There is a labor studies program at the um, LA Trade Tech. Oh. Uh, Southwest College has oh. hosted some uh, workshops hey. in um, Collective Remake. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Uh, yes. And, uh, which I think would be another great guest now. for our show. Yeah, because 95% yeah. of all business incubators are yeah. uh, at educational institutions. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So oh, wow. I did now, not know that. That's a lot. Yeah, that's most business incubators are at, attached to educational institutions, mm -hmm. universities, and whatnot. 
That's fantastic. That's good to know. Yeah. That's really good to know. That's uh, we'll have to look into uh, going into that subject matter a lot more yeah. going forward. Well, you know, in our business schools, we have to um, you know reach out to people who are faculty at business schools. Yeah. Uh, because they're only teaching one business model. That's exactly. right. That's uh, we right. Exactly. Have to let them know that there is this alternative business model. Yeah. And, and we, right. we need, yes, we need, we need a new education for a new type of manager, cooperative manager. That, right. That's, that's, that's absolutely right. Capitalist executive. Yeah. We need and to get those entrepreneurs where they're first starting out. Right. And I know we've already kind of gone into this a little bit, but let's watch our third video now with uh, Professor Richard Wolf. And um, I would call this video. Uh, uh, <laughs> Crisis leading to the failure of capitalism. This is Professor Richard Wolff again. Here we are in the second biggest crisis. We're not establishing social security, we're cutting it. We're not extending unemployment benefits, we just finished cutting them off. And we don't even discuss a public employment program. Wow. It's all been undone. So here was the mistake. You cannot solve the contradictions, the catastrophes, the crises of capitalism. You cannot undo the abandonment of North America, Western Europe, and Japan in the way I described unless you deal with the organization of the enterprise. Who makes the decisions? for what purposes about the daily functioning of an enterprise. If you don't deal with that, then the people who are in charge, the major shareholders and the boards of directors will move out of the country, will undo the federal rules and regulations, and keep producing crises the way capitalism always has. Capitalism has been dominant for 250 years. It has never solved economic crisis. Roosevelt made speech after speech at which he said, my policies will not only get us out of the Great Depression, but if they will make sure that no future downturn like this will afflict our children. That was a promise he made, but he could not keep. Every president since Roosevelt, including Obama, has promised the same. My policies will get us out of the downturn and will make sure this never happens again. None of them has ever delivered on this promise. They can't, because to deliver on that promise, even though I don't understand it, means to undo the system that presents us with the problem. If you lived in an apartment with a roommate as unstable as capitalism has been, you would have moved out long ago or demanded that your roommate get professional help. Why do we accept to live in a system that works this way? So Richard Wolff, uh, that's a, a, a long-running joke that he has about if you had a roommate that was uh, as dysfunctional as capitalism, you would have moved out long ago. Uh, you know, it's so true, though. I mean, story. it's a lot of, yeah. <laughs> or, or, he says, uh, suggested that he get professional help. <laughs> I like that. This is not a panacea. And so people have to knuckle down, and they have to realize that if we don't do this, there's going to be hell to pay. You know, because our economy, we're not going to own right. our own economy. That's right. We think in the American Revolution that we got rid of monarchy. No, we <laughs> no, didn't. Right. No, right. we've got a worse situation now. Yeah, and that's right. uh, we need to get that mindset back in yep. place. We have oligarchs today. Yes. Yes. Oligarchs, that's right, <laughs> yeah. which is worse yeah. than actually monarchy. <laughs> because uh, who was it? I think it was Noam Chomsky mm -hmm. uh, that I saw recently made a comment about uh, the difference between you know, the feudal system and capitalism is that. You know, in the feudal system, the monarchs were kind of really uh, easy in the long run to overthrow because they weren't as competent. <laughs> yeah. You know, and now in capitalism, you have you know a lot of more, well, at least the appearance of competency. Now, what he was trying to say is, you know, corporate capitalists now are actually private tyrannies. They're actually feudal yeah. systems, but more efficient. Yes. Yeah. As yes, that's right. Yeah, that's right. The yeah. That's, what that's, what he's, that's what he was trying basically. to say, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So you know. So uh, speaking of you know, political solutions, of which uh, I alluded to one uh, that is not actually a solution, <laughs> um, 
but we're in crisis politically as yeah. well as economically. And one of the hopeful signs that I've seen in the world actually is the the Labor Party and what recently happened uh, there with uh, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, who was actually uh, be able to bring approximately 30 more seats to the uh, at, least, at least the left wing of the uh, Labor Party in uh, in Great Britain. So. Uh, that's huge, and, and it's a lot of the platform, or is, is called manifesto, mm -hmm. is is on the based on the concept of a democratizing uh, the economy, the economy mm -hmm. because that they're they're basing it on uh, a model that was attempted to be put into place in the late 1970s. People are starting to realize, hey, democratizing the economy sounds like a really good idea. Right. Uh, so we need to analyze this and study it more, and especially in going forward. Uh, how to move forward in our election seasons to make the right kinds of decisions if we can mm -hmm. because we are in, in definitely a political crisis as everybody knows. And working for corporations you see our labor power is making them rich and then they use that wealth right. against us. Yes. So you know getting people to think about not working for corporations that's difficult because you yeah. know everybody's got to feed their family, put the kids through college, buy a home. Uh, you know, these are the things that they, they want to accomplish in their, their lifetime, and we have to offer an alternative. Right. Yes. An alternative that works. Our closing statements, starting with Eric. Um, I basically just uh, think that the worker cooperative movement is the road forward for a better economy, and I, uh, I think that uh, that will also help us improve our political system. George. I second that, and I think uh, that right now we need some innovative changes in thinking, and we need a new future with new politics and new economic thinking. And Liz. And I'll go back to my original, which is that we need to own our own economy again. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that this is a, a, a theme that uh, both sides of the political table can agree on, that small businesses are the source of jobs, mm -hmm. and uh, having those jobs locally owned is the ideal situation. Uh, and I think we can bring both sides of the political table together uh, on the, that theme that we need to own our own economy. Yeah, and on that note, I would say uh, as this whole session has been great, thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, on the show today. And Pleasure. Uh, democratizing our enterprises and democratizing the economy, that is where we are, and there will, there will be more on these subjects coming on future Now Man shows, so be sure to tune in. And thank you so much for watching, if you're watching on YouTube as well. This is Nice Wonder. Be present, always. The past is gone, the future is yet to come. It's now, right now. I wanna know I did the right thing and had a lot of